I'm Captain Obvious, and Hotels.com rewards me basically everywhere. So why am I hosting a dental convention after party? Sometimes you bend, sometimes you stand, sometimes you turn your back to the wind. There's a world outside every darkened door where blues won't haunt you anymore. Where the brave are free and lovers soar. Come ride with me to the distant shore. We won't hesitate to break down the garden gate. There's not much time left today. Okay, time to get started with class. So, um, quick reminder, homework three is due Friday. I hope you have all already started it. Please start homework early. I said this last week. I'll say it again this week. Please start homework early. Maybe you can write it down. Um, as you can see, homework party gets pretty crowded, and we try to have a lot of people there to be able to help you out, but there are office hours on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday that have lots and lots of empty space. So if you start the homework early, talk to the TAs early, you will be able to get more personal attention and more help. And we really try to do the best we can given you know how many people there are in this class. So help us by uh, help us help you. Homework party is in the Waz lounge. Same place as last time. Uh, it is on the website. There's a homework party on Wednesday and Thursday. But today, we're going to start covering, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, and we're going to talk more about vector spaces and subspaces. And we will learn some more jargon. You already know what span is, but we will see that span can also be called range. It's also called a column space. And we'll talk about 
basis vectors, and we'll talk about null spaces. And um, yeah, we'll see. We'll cover more if we get to it. So last time, we talked very quickly about introducing the idea of a vector space, right? And when you think about a vector space, um, there are really two main properties that you want to be thinking about. And this is this idea of closure under vector addition and scalar multiplication. So we're thinking, basically, of a set of vectors v and scalars f, vectors and and we saw it last time that there's a couple of different properties that need to be satisfied by this set of vectors as well as by this set of scalars. And then uh, in discussion yesterday, you also got to see a bunch more. Um, you, you saw this once again, as well as you got to see a couple of examples of, um, of this, right? So who wants to give me an example of a vector space. What is the easiest, simplest example of vector of a vector space that we've already discussed in lecture many, many times? Yeah, R two, great example. So let's think about R two, which is the set of all two component vectors, and what is the uh, set of scalars you're going to associate with it? Just the real numbers. So, for example, here's a vector space. And how do we draw it? We have the x1 axis and the y, uh, x2 axis. And what are the key properties we want to check to make sure that um, this is actually a vector space, right? We have the properties of vector addition. But we know that vectors actually are commutative. Vectors are associative. We want to know whether there is a zero element. So is there a zero element in this vector space? Is there an inverse? So for every v, do we have an element minus v such that v plus minus v gives us the zero element? Right? We have that. And how do we check for closure under addition? Well, let's say I have some vector here, a. And I add to it some other vector, b. Does a plus b also lie in the same vector space? Yep. What if I was to scale a? What if I was to take this vector a and scale it, let's say, by 2? I would get the following long vector, right? 2a, also in the vector space. Let's say I was to scale it by negative 2. I would get minus a. Right? So R2 is the most common example of a vector space. And it's something that you've already interacted with. Um, so let's see a couple more examples. So what if you think about the following example? Let's consider the span of 0, 1, 1, 0. How many people think that this is a vector space? How many people think it's not a vector space? Does anyone want to volunteer why they think it's a vector space or not a vector space? Back. It spans R2. So the comment was it spans R2. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on why that means it's a vector space? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so what he's saying is that these are two independent vectors. The spans are two. So what does the span of this set mean? It means that basically we're looking at all vectors, alpha 
times uh, 0, 1 plus beta times 1, 0. And we know that we can get anywhere in R2 by this linear combination, right? So the set of vectors in the span of 0, 1, 1, 0, what is this? It is all of the vectors in R2. So this is just a different way of writing exactly the same vector field, uh, vector space, sorry, that we wrote up here. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions about this? So this is also a vector space. Why? Because you can think about adding any of these two. Yeah, question? Is this like an R scalar? Great question. Great question. She was asking, are, what is the set of scalars here? And here, we're thinking about real numbers as the set of scalars. So here, f is equal to all of the real numbers, and v is equal to um, this set of vectors in the span of these two vectors. Is that clear? Other questions? Yeah? The question was, do you always have to have the set of real numbers here as the scalars, or can you do something else? No, you can actually define different notions. So if you were to take a class in number theory, um, you can define different notions of addition and multiplication than the ad vector addition and multiplication that we've defined here. And you can have different uh, sets here of scalars. But in this class, almost always, you're going to be thinking about um, the set of scalars being R. In fact, sometimes we will, if it's so obvious what the set of scalars is, we might even, like, kind of for just uh, brevity, not actually even write out this R. OK? Great. So let's choose another example. What about this set? Is this a vector space? Oh, you can't see it. Well. Where was your telepathy to tell me the answer? Is this a vector space? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up. Why is it a vector space? There's only one vector, right? You add it, you add zero to itself, you get zero. You scale zero by something, you still get zero. Um, so, great. What about example? Um, what about this? Is this a vector space? How many people think yes? How many people think no? Anyone want to justify why they think what they think? Someone on this side. We asked a question on that side last time. Someone on this side answer. I saw lots of people raise their hands. Yeah. You can multiply it by 2 and get a different vector. Great. So if I take 1, 0, and I multiply it by 2, I get 2, 0. Is 2, 0 part of our set? Nope. Right? I could do the same thing. What if I take 1, 0? plus 1, 0. What do I get? I get 2, 0, right? I can add two vectors in the set. Do I get the same? Do I get a vector inside the set? Nope. So this is not a vector space. Um, OK, what about another example? What about 1, 0, 0, 1? Is this a vector space? How many people think it is a vector space? How many people think it is not a vector space? OK. Explain to your neighbor why you think what you think. 
One second. Well, maybe five. Okay, so how many people think it is a vector space? Raise your hand. How many people think it is a vector space? How many people think it's not a vector space? So why is it not a vector space? Perfect answer. Point number one, does it contain the zero vector? Nope. Second, if I add 1, 0 plus 0, 1, is it in the set? Nope. So do you see the difference between these two examples? So here, when we looked at the span of this set, the span is saying, take these two vectors and include all linear combinations of them. So when you do that, what do you automatically guarantee having in the set? What is a vector that is in the span of any set of vectors, always. The zero vector, right? As soon as you say the span of a set of vectors, boom, you get the zero vector for free. So span allows you to always have all of these linear combinations, which means that you always have closure under scalar multiplication, because what does scalar multiplication is just a linear, it's a special kind of linear combination, right? When you say span, you always have closure under vector addition, because vector addition is just a special linear combination with coefficients that are 1. And when you say span, you always get the zero vector, because the zero vector is just a linear combination with zero weights. Is that clear to everyone? So yes, question. Um, can you repeat the question? Can you subtract a vector from itself? So yes, a linear combination would be a su subtracting a vector from itself. So if I, but the question is, even if I could subtract 1, 0, minus 1, 0, I would get 0, 0, but it wouldn't be in the set, right? I don't have my set. How many vectors are there in this set? Only two. I can't add new vectors into this set. When I say span of this, this is just a compact representation for an infinite number of vectors. Whereas here, I only have two vectors. So don't confuse a set of vectors with the span of the set of vectors. The span of a set of vectors is always much larger. Yes, question? Did I switch the brackets and the parentheses? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, you can say, it doesn't really matter. It's just a question of, you can write it either way. But yeah, just for consistency. Yes, question. Can I have a set of what numbers? Um, can you, instead of the set of real numbers, can you have a set of empty numbers? N no, because you're required, like the definition of a vector space requires a set of scalars that you can use to scale. So an empty set would be no scalars to scale. Okay, so I want to make sure, like when we think about a span, how many vectors are we thinking about? The span of a matrix, the span of a set of vectors. We have infinite number of vectors, right? When I think of a set of vectors, how many vectors do I have? Whatever number there are, right? Here there's two. Um, in this set of vectors, there's two vectors. In this set of vectors, there's one vector. So if you wanted to have a vector space with exactly one element, what would that be? Zero. Is there any other way to have a vector space with only one element? Let's say you're restricting yourself to vectors in R2. No, right? 
So um, you basically are going to end up in a situation where you're going to either have an infinite number of vectors, or you're going to have one vector when you're thinking about vector spaces in the context of R2. Um, OK, one last example. What about the span of uh, 1, 0? Is this a vector space? How many people think it's a vector space? How many people think not? Yep. Why is this why is this a vector space? So when I say span, I mean that I can take any scalar multiple of this, right? So when I draw this, I'm sorry? It includes the zero vector, right? When I take the span, it means I can take zero times this guy. And when I draw this out, what is this going to be? It's just going to be a line, right? One, zero is just going to be the entire line where I'm thinking of x1. So this vector space, it is in R2, but is this point, is this vector, is vector b inside this vector space? No, right? But is this vector c inside this vector space? Yes. So when I, I can have a vector space that is contained entirely in R2, right? It's a vector space of two-dimensional vectors, but it doesn't mean it has to span all of R2. So this, we're going to actually define. We have a special word for this. And this is what we call a subspace. So let's say v, f is a vector space. Then if a subset of vectors in v form a vector space, then let's say it's called the subset s, then s comma f is a subspace of v comma f. So what's another subspace so of R2 that I can think about? Is this guy a subspace? And what about this guy? Yeah? OK. Talk to your neighbor and come up with a line in R2 that is not a subspace. Take a minute. Talk to your neighbor. Draw a line. Add a line to this picture that is not a subspace. Make sure you don't leave people out. <laughs> okay, we'll get to it. Have you talked to your neighbors? Do your neighbors understand? You're all you're all confused? Okay. Go back and forth. Look at the row in front, row in back. Try to explain to your, each other. We'll get to it.
Okay. How many people think they have an example? How many people think they want another minute? How many people are like, this is not a fair question. It seems like a trick question. I'm a nice person. <laughs> it's not a trick question. So let's think about this line, right? Let's think about why this yellow line is a subspace. So if I take a vector in this line, in this space, so let's take this vector. Let's call this vector d. And I add another vector on this line to d. So what's another vector on this line? Let's say um, e is another vector on this line. Is d plus e still on the yellow line? Right? So is the yellow line closed under vector addition? Um, does, what about scaling d and e? Do they still stay in the same line? What about a zero vector? Does it have a zero vector? Does it have an additive inverse? So what is the inverse of d? What would it look like? Draw, like, make a hand motion. Right? So where would minus d be? Minus d would be somewhere like that. So there is an inverse. OK, so basically, you could check every single one of these properties, and you see that they're satisfied for this line d. But what about this line? Um, I'm just going to take this and translate it. Is this line, are the, is the set of vectors contained on this line, are they, do they form a vector space? Why don't they form a vector space? There's no zero vector, right? There's no zero vector. So if you don't have a zero vector, can you have an additive inverse? No, right? Because you cannot add something to get that zero. So what about this line? Is that a subspace? Because these, none of these are actually vector spaces, right? To be a subspace, first, the space must be a vector space. Yeah? If the axes and basis vectors are relative, though, can't they still be vector spaces if the origin is removed and the zero vector is still part of them? Good question. The question is, if the axes are relative, can they still be a vector space if the axes are moved? And it's a, it's a subtle question. And at some level, uh, the answer is yes. At some level, the answer is no. Because when I tell you the representation of this line, I'm saying this line according to these axes. Right? If I redefine my 0 to be here, I could say that. But then I'm thinking of a subspace of an entirely different space. Right? I have already defined to you my vector space, which is R2. And I'm saying, is this a subspace of this specific vector space, R2? If I defined a different vector space, something might be a subspace of a different vector space. But given the framework that you currently have defined, it will not be a subspace. Is that clear? So you, even if you like modify things, um, you have to remember the context in which you are actually operating on. So for example, one of the places where this comes up commonly is when you're dealing with robotics. So often in robotics uh, situations, you're thinking about a, a robot or a drone, and you often have two what they call frames of reference, which is essentially vector spaces. One is the frame of reference of the Earth, which is static. And the second is the frame of reference of the drone. So let's say you have a drone, which is you know um, a quadcopter that is flying around. It will change its orientations, and hence its internal frame of reference will change, but it will still be in the same frame of reference with respect to the ground. And you will go back and forth between doing calculations in one frame of reference or vector space to the other. And as we go on in this class, you will see a little bit of this. But if you want to really learn more about this, you can take classes in control, like 
128, um, and then you can take uh, a class like 221A. And this will really teach you how you can think about transforming from uh, one vector space to another. So a long answer to a short question. OK. Um, any other questions about subspaces? At the back, blue t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, oh, blue t-shirt. The question is, when I have a single line, can I not multiply it by the zero vector to get a zero vector? Well, I could multiply a vector here by the zero vector, and it would give me the zero vector, but does it lie on the line? Right? So I could multiply it by the zero vector to, to by zero to get a zero vector, but it's not part of the, so the set of vectors that we had originally defined. Green t-shirt. OK. Yeah, black t-shirt. How would you write that vector? Um, the question is, how do you write the orange line as a vector? So all of you know how to find the equation of a line, right? So if you have the equation of a line, let's say you have x1 plus x2 is equal to 1. This is the equation of a line, right? How do you write that as a vector? Um, take a minute, and actually, this is a good exercise. Talk to your neighbor and write this equation as a vector. You can write it as a set of vectors. Talk to your neighbor and do this. Good exercise. Good question. How many people can are done? OK, how many people need another minute? OK. The people who need another minute should be writing something. OK, how many people are done? OK, so if I want to write this as a vector, you've seen these parametric forms, right? So if I write this equation, I can rewrite this as x1 equal to 1 minus x2. So what is the first component, x1? Um, sorry, what is the first component here? 1 minus x2 and x2. So all vectors of this form, and if I wanted to write this further, I can write this as uh, 1, 0, plus um, x2 times minus 1, 1. Does everyone see that? Does everyone see how a set of vectors, if I say the set of all these vectors, so what is this? This is basically 1, 0 plus the span of minus 1, 1. Right? It's a really good question. Like, that's why I wanted you all to do the exercise. Does everyone see? 
Okay. Great. Moving on. So span, as you can see, is something that is really, really important as a concept. In fact, it is so important that we gave it lots of names. So when I say span of a set of vectors, I can use, I basically mean the span of, you know, the columns of A. And so just to introduce some jargon, the range of a set of vectors, which is also the range of the columns of a matrix A, is the same as the span. And furthermore, this is also called the column space of a matrix A. So the span of A is equal to the range of A is equal to the column space of A. And why do you think we call it a column space? Because the span of a set of vectors is always a vector space, right? By definition, we're saying that all linear combinations of the column vectors are in the set. So the vector is by definition closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition and includes the zero vector. So these are three words that you should know that are used interchange interchangeably. When you're thinking about the span, really you're talking about like, can I get to a certain point using these vectors, right? So if I think about, when I think about any two vectors and whether they span R2, this vector and this vector span R2 because I can get to any point using a linear combination of this vector and this vector, right? I can also use a linear combination of the yellow vector and the pink vector. Or I can use a linear combination of the orange vector and the pink vector. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So um, to repeat that, uh, the two black lines, the first two lines that I drew, they definitely span the space. I can get anywhere in R2 as a linear combination of this pink vector and this, basically, the x2 axis and the x1 axis. I can also get there as a linear combination of this yellow and this pink. But can I get there as a linear combination of the orange and the yellow? Assume these are parallel lines. Can I get anywhere in R2? No, right? So do these span the space? No. OK, great. So let's move on. Um, so with this, we can think now, we can start to think about different ways of representing a vector space. And let's now consider this. Let's consider the span of the following set. Uh, or matrix, let's say, 0, 1, 1, 0, 2, 2. What is the span of this set? You should know this by now. Just shout it out. R2, right? Is this the most convenient way to write the span of R2, to write out R2? What is the span of... One, one, zero, two. What is the span of this? R2. So if I wanted to keep describing to you R2, is this a smart way of going about it? Clearly, it's a bad way, right? <laughs> So for this reason, what we're going to do is we're going to define one more thing. We're going to define a concept called a basis. And what is a basis? A basis is what I like to think about as a minimum spanning set. A minimum spanning set is basically the minimum a set of vectors that is the smallest number of vectors such that you can actually span the entire set. So for example, is this guy a basis for R2? No. What about this guy? But what about this guy? This is a basis, right? 
Um, so let's define it just a little bit more formally. Like intuitively, this is the idea we want to capture. But formally, it's convenient to define it using linear dependence and linear independence. So if I think about a vector space Vf, the basis of the vector space um, is given by, let's say, or let, let's say V1, V2, Vn, the set of n vectors, is a basis for Vf if first V1, V2, Vn are linearly independent and two um, if for any V belonging to V, we can write V as a linear combination of these vectors. So let's say V1, V2, Vn is a set of linearly dependent vectors. What is one of our definitions for linearly dependent vectors? It means that you have one of the vectors in the set that can be written as a linear combination of the others, right? So can this be a minimum number of vectors that is needed to span the set? If it's linearly dependent, I'm telling you that there's some notion of redundancy in there, right? One vector can be written as a linear combination of the others which means that fundamentally it is, not, uh, it is not a basis. So what this is saying is like keep throwing out vectors one by one until you have a linearly independent set. So another reason to say that this is not a basis is because it's not linearly independent. This is not a basis because it's not linearly independent. This is a basis because it is linearly independent. However, any vector v in R2 can be written as a linear combination of these guys. It can also be written as a linear combination of these guys. And it can also be written as a linear combination of these guys. So you know, let's take some examples. So example, let's think about uh, the following set, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Is this a basis for R3? So here, notice that I'm thinking about the vector field R3, comma R, but when I'm speaking, I'm just saying R3 because the scalars that I'm using are implicit and obvious. So if I just say vector space R3, remember that implicitly I'm talking about the set of vectors R3 and the set of scalars in R. So is this a basis for R3? How would you check this? Are the vectors linearly independent? Yes. And can you write any vector as a linear combination of these vectors? Right? Great. Um, is this a basis for R4? No, right? This is not a basis for R4. Is it a linearly independent set? Yes, but can you write any vector in R4 as a linear combination of these guys? No, right? So you have to always check both the conditions. What about, is this a basis for R3? What about this set? No, why is it not a basis for R3? They're linearly dependent, right? How do you see that they're linearly dependent? This guy plus this guy equal to this guy, right? Is that true? No. Two times this guy plus this guy equal to this guy. Okay, good. 
which giving this to one last one last definition which is dimension so everyone has been like all of you know what 2d means what 3d means what 4d means but why do we call 2d 2d right where is this word coming from the dimension of a vector space is the number of vectors in the basis so number of vectors in the basis so for example this is a basis set and the number of vectors uh here is 2 this is a basis for r2 um this guy is a basis for r3 there's three vectors so the dimension of r3 is 3 it is not a basis for r4 how many vectors would there be in uh a basis for r4 four okay so dimension is not really a complicated concept i just wanted to like quickly define it okay so next example what if i think about the set of all vectors all x such that 1 2 what about this sex oop what about this set is the set of all these vectors does it make a vector space how many people think yes how many people think no how many people don't know how to start okay so how many people know how to solve a system of linear equations really <laughs> okay so for the people who don't know how to start how would you start solve the system of linear equations so solve it you have 30 seconds So when I draw out this set when I draw out all of the x's that satisfy the system if I draw a picture I get this line right I get basically x1 plus 2x2 equal to 1 So is this a vector space No right Doesn't have the zero vector Um so now what about this case so let's say 1 2 0 2 2 x equal to How many people know how to start? It should be everyone. Okay. So, what is the set of vectors that satisfies this equation? Zero vector. Right? The only vector that satisfies this is the zero vector. So x is equal to 0. What did we see last time? 
If the columns of a matrix are linearly independent, how many solutions does this equation have? One, right? If the columns are linearly independent, you exactly have one solution. There, is no, there are no non-trivial solutions, right? That is the definition of linear independence. And these columns are clearly linearly independent. This is already an upper triangular form for you guys, right? But is this a vector space? Right? All x that satisfy this, this forms a vector space. That's surprising. So how do we figure out? Like, are there some equations where, you know, you end up with a vector space, other equations where you don't? What is the deal here, right? This one wasn't a vector space. This one, it is a vector space. And this is what we kind of want to figure out in the rest of this, rest of this lecture. So before we get entirely to that, um, I'll just give you a quick definition, and then we'll move into an example that will help uh, you know, clarify these things. So I want to define the notion of the null space. The null space of a matrix A is the set of all vectors x such that A times x equal to 0 for x belonging to Rm, let's say, where m... Uh, is the number of equations that you have. So this is A is N by M. So what is the null space of this guy? It's the set of all vectors such that A times that vector is 0. So the null space of 1, 2, 0, 2 is equal to the zero vector. We talked at the beginning about particular solutions and homogeneous solutions. And here we're seeing that, you know, there's something special about when things are equal to zero. And the proof that you did in discussion last uh, yesterday, right? Did you solve it out by thinking about a case where there is, like, looking at when the matrix times a vector is zero and then when the matrix times a vector is non-zero, right? If you don't remember this, go back and look through what happened in discussion yesterday and think about it in the context of what we're talking about today. All these things are connected and organized so that you can interconnect all of these ideas. So now we have this definition. And uh, remember that this is very similar. This looks very, very similar to linear dependence and independence, right? What can we say if I tell you that the columns of A are linearly independent? How many vectors are going to be in the null space of A? A has linearly independent columns. How big is the null space of A? What do we know from last time? There's only one solution, right, if the columns of A are linearly independent. So the null space of A has one vector in it. But what about if the columns of A are linearly dependent, right? Remember last time we talked about, well, sometimes A is invertible, sometimes A is not invertible. And how did we decide whether A was invertible or not invertible, right? How did we connect up? We connected up through whether the columns of A were linearly dependent or linearly independent. It was only, like, this lecture just happened Tuesday. All of you are looking at me like I'm just dropped from another planet. Does everyone remember this discussion? OK. So basically, what we're now trying to understand, you all had questions about, well, is A always invertible? How do we understand this? And this is what we're trying to get into. Well, what, like trying to understand better the kinds of A's that have linearly dependent columns and hence are not invertible. So let us now look at a particular example. So 
So I was thinking of this example because someone submitted a song uh, that was played in class today, uh, the highway song, Life is a Highway. I haven't actually seen the movie, but I hear it is good. But let's think about a highway example. Let us really think about trying to monitor traffic. For those of you who are more interested in this, um, people like Praveen, Varaya, Alex, Bayan, these are all faculty in our department who do a lot of research on actually understanding traffic between cities and traffic on highways and how to understand and model traffic. So this is going to be a very, very baby example of this, but if you're interested, definitely go check out their websites, You know, find their graduate students, talk to them, learn more. So let's say we have the following problem. Let's say we have a couple of cities. This is Berkeley. Um, let's say this is San Francisco. Let's say this is Oakland. And let's say this is Palo Alto. And let's say we have highways connecting these cities. And they're one-way highways. From Berkeley, you can go to SF. From SF, you can go to Palo Alto. From Palo Alto, you can go to Oakland. And from Oakland, you can go back to Berkeley. And there are cars traveling along these highways. So let's say there are X1 cars here, X2 cars here, X3 cars here, X4 cars here. And let's say that, you know, Cars cannot stop in any city. They cannot accumulate. If you've ever tried to drive on the Bay Bridge, you might feel like, why is everyone also driving on the Bay Bridge? Does no one ever stay in their houses? This is what we're modeling. Everyone is just constantly driving around in these loops, let's say. Um, so... What we're going to try and understand is if I wanted to monitor the traffic on this traffic network, how many sensors would I need to try and actually measure this? So what I have here is I know that there can be no accumulation. So that means that the total number of cars that accumulate at this node has to be zero. What does that mean? The number of cars coming in had better be equal to the number of cars going out, right? Number of cars coming in better be equal to going out. In has to be equal to out. So can you write this as a system of linear equations? OK, do it. 30 seconds. Is this what you got? So basically, what am I saying? I'm saying that the traffic coming into Berkeley had better be the traffic going out of Berkeley. So um, let's have this convention that coming in a flow is positive. So x4 minus x1 is equal to 0. Then x1 minus x2 is equal to 0. That's the second row. Then x2 minus x3 is equal to 0, that's the third row, and x3 minus x4 is equal to 0, that's the fourth row, right? So remember, our variables are the number of cars on each of the roads, OK? So how many people have already solved this system of linear equations? What's the solution? How did you solve this? If you did Gaussian elimination on this, what are you going to get? I'm going to do, basically, if I add these two rows, R1 plus R2, I will get minus 1, 0, 0, 1.
right? And I can do some more steps, and you've all done this a million times now, so you're not going to do it again. And I will get Gaussian elimination will give me this. Oh, and I guess I have this row of zeros here. So when I see this row of zeros equal to zero, I know that I have how many free variables? One free variable, right? Basically, this is telling me that I have x4 as one free variable. And let's look at this kind of picture here. If I wanted to measure the traffic from Berkeley to San Francisco, I knew that the system satisfied um, the system equations, but I could only put a sensor, let's say, in Palo Alto. I could only put a sensor right at the outlink of Palo Alto, so I can measure x3. What does that tell me about x1? Can I understand what x1 is by knowing x3? Because all the flow here has to go here, here has to go here, right? So intuitively, you see on this graph, without even writing out the system of equations, that you have to have x1 equal to x2 equal to x3 equal to x4, right? Is that clear to everyone? Because there's no other way for you to satisfy this set of equations. And what do the equations actually tell you? They tell you that x4 is free. x4 is free, let's say. And then x3 must be equal to x4. x2 must be equal to x4. And x1 must be equal to x4, right? That's exactly what the system of equations is telling you. So you're saying basically you have this one degree of freedom that is coming from this one row of zeros. And so if I wanted to write out all of the possible flows of this setup, what could I write it out as? So take a minute, talk to your neighbor, and actually see if you can write out as a set of vectors, as a vector space, what are the possible flows that are allowed on this network? Talk to your neighbors. Make sure that no one is left out. If you're confused about something, use this chance to ask your neighbor. Make sure no one's left out. Make sure no one's left out. Better yet, make a new friend. Talk to someone you haven't talked to before. So how many people are done? How many people need another minute? One person. Anyone more than one person need another minute? OK, you get 30 seconds. Question? The question was, why is x4 free? Because when I'm thinking about this, I'm here, I have this, basically, I have a zero pivot here, right? So I have zero equal to zero. This is my last equation. So I have zero x4 equal to zero. What values of x4 satisfy that? OK, how many people are done? Everyone's done, right? So. 
Does someone want to tell me what they, what, how they can write all possible flows as a vector space? Anyone want to volunteer? Yeah. The span of one, 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 one. So let's think about the following vector. One, 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 one. And let's think of the span of it. Right? What is this equal to? This is basically saying x1, x2, x3, x4 are all equal. So if I take x4 times 1, 1, 1, 1, or any other parameter, right? I just happen to call this x4. You can call this your favorite whatever Greek variable um, or other variable. Let's call it alpha. All, any such flows, right? If the traffic from Palo Alto to Oakland is a million, then all four links must have a million cars. If there is, if the flow from Palo Alto to Oakland is one, then everywhere else, there's exactly one car, right? You can choose one parameter, which sets everything else, right? So there's an infinite number of solutions with this kind of one free parameter. Okay, so do you see now, we have this matrix A, we're setting it up. This is our vector of unknowns. Again, we're setting up a different model, and it's equal to this, you know, zero vector, right? This is related to how we define the null space. In fact, this is exactly how we define the null space. So now, if you were to try, if, you did, if I was to ask you, what is the null space of this matrix? Let's call this A. Sometimes these are called incidence matrices. If I was to ask you, what is the null space of this matrix A, what is it? It is this thing, right? You just solve for it, right? Because any such vector that you put in, you're going to get out the zero vector. Is that clear to everyone? OK, so now let's quickly consider um, a second graph. So let's say now we have Berkeley, Oakland, SF, Palo Alto. And here we have, now we have two dimensional roads, x2, and let's say this is x3, x4. So you could write this incident matrix out in this way. You might get a different order of rows depending on what order you wrote the equations in. I wrote this equation for Berkeley, this equation. So Berkeley, basically, inflow x1, outflow x2 must be 0. Here I have um, inflow x2 minus outflow x1 must be 0. Um, this is the row for San Francisco. This is the row for Palo Alto. So when you do Gaussian elimination on this, what do you get? How many free rows are there at the end? You get 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 0. And does someone want to tell me what these rows are up top here? 1. 0, 0, and what do I have here? Right? So if I have two free rows, what does that mean? How many free parameters do I have now? I'm going to have two free parameters. So what does this say? Let me set x4. I say from this row, I see x4 must be equal to x3, and x2 must be equal to x1. So this 
is a line, right? We've, been, we've talked about how a line and a vector uh, can be represented as a set of vectors. So this is basically the set of vectors 0, 0, 1, 1 times alpha. And this is the set of vectors 1, 1, 0, 0. I'm not going through the details here because now you've done lots and lots of Gaussian elimination. You've solved lots and lots of systems of equations, right? So you should be able to follow um, how I ended up with this matrix and how we ended up getting to um, these two actual constraints, right? Two rows of zeros, two free parameters. And so now I have these two vectors. And I'm going to assign you some uh, homework which um, you can do in class if you have the time. So if this is the incidence matrix A, what is A times alpha 0, 0, 1, 1? Actually, just do it now. It should take you 30 seconds. 1, 1, 0, 0. What is A multiplied by this vector? What did you solve for? How did you find out these vectors? What is this equal to? Zero, right? This is the zero vector. Does it matter what alpha and beta are? No, right? For all linear combinations. So again, if I was to think about the null space of this A matrix, it is the span of 0, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 0, 0. Right? Everyone with me here? Any questions on this? Any questions on how we got here, what we did? Anything? Yeah? I'm sorry? Do the multiplication out. Do the multiplication out. Take this times this. See what you get out. What did we solve for? We solved for trying to find all vectors such that this times that vector. I'm writing shorthand. So this is basically this times x1, x2, x3, x4 equal to 0, 0, 0, 0. Then I solved that system of linear equations using Gaussian elimination. Right? And when I solved that using Gaussian elimination, I got the following solutions. I got these two vectors as my solutions. Right? So if I had solved for vectors such that this is true, I get out. So what are, basically, intuitively, look at this graph, right? Here, I have some traffic between Berkeley and Oakland, and I have some traffic between San Francisco and Palo Alto. Does the traffic between Berkeley and Oakland affect the traffic between San Francisco and Palo Alto according to this model? So if I wanted to figure out what is the number of measurements I need to take to understand the traffic from, uh, like traffic on all four of these roads, how many measurements do I need to take? Two, right? Because I need to measure either x1 or x2, and I need to measure either x3 or x4. So I basically need to have two more measurements. Why do I need to have two more measurements? Because I have two free parameters. So if I wanted to basically have four equations for my four unknowns, I need to take two more measurements. I have two constraints that are given from the model, but I end up with these two free parameters, which means I need two more measurements. Is that clear to everyone? Where this zero, why we're setting this up equal to zero, 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 zero? We're setting it up equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, because we're saying, according to this traffic model, we're not allowing for any number of cars accumulating in Berkeley or accumulating in Oakland. No cars accumulating in SF or accumulating in Palo Alto. Is that clear to everyone? OK. So in case it's not clear to you where this is coming from, check this multiplication. Please do it out by hand. It will be helpful for you. 
So with that, I actually wanted to, oh, I'm out of paper, okay. Um, let us consider the following matrix, finally. A is equal to 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, minus 1, 2, 0, 3. Write this matrix down because it's going to disappear in a minute. And we want to find the null space of this matrix. OK, everyone wrote the matrix down, right? Because it disappeared. So wh what are we going to do here? So this is a demo that, again, one of your amazing ASCs made. You guys are super lucky. Um, and what is it saying here? Let's, say, let's take this A, which is this matrix that you all wrote down already, right? And are, you've already calculated the null space of this, right? OK. So. While I'm doing this demo, how you, I want you to calculate the null space on the side. How are you going to calculate the null space on the side? What system of equations are you going to set up? Linear combination of these columns is equal to 0. Good. Go at it. One day when you get to be a professor, you get to use Python to do it. And I, you can, I can just run the function. But you had to calculate it out. So what is this saying? So I did the Gaussian elimination, and what did I get out? Basically that the span of minus 3 over 2, 1 half 1 is the null space of this. And how did I do that? I said, let me do the Gaussian elimination on this. I get one row of free parameters, one row of zeros. It's not going to be no solutions, because remember, my right-hand side is a column of zeros. So I have x3. So now can I use x3 to write x2 in terms of x3? What does this tell me? It tells me that x2 minus x3 over 2 is 0. So I get x2 in terms of x3. I can use that again to back substitute into the first equation. And I get, again, that x1 is 3 quarters over x3. And when I look at these rows, right? Let's look at these rows. Let's draw your attention. Like Everyone actually look at what I'm doing. Just stop writing for a second. So let's look at A and look at, these, look at this matrix. The first row is our first equation. And what are, the what are the variables in play in the first equation? x1, x2, and x3, right? What are the variables in play in the second equation? x2 and x3, right? Does x1 matter? Not really. What about the third row? Only x1 and x3, right? So what we're going to do now is actually show this in a plot. So what? 
So in a three-dimensional space, when I have, you know, an equation like x1 plus x2 equal to something, what does this give me? It gives me a plane, right? So this constraint, each of these constraints here, can you, can you see what I'm pointing at? Yes, you can. Each of these constraints here is giving me a plane in the three-dimensional space, right? So what Pranav, who is the amazing ASC that actually made this demo for us, is showing, he's plotting the plane of the first constraint, the plane of the second constraint, and the plane of the third constraint. So you see that this constraint doesn't involve x1, right? And so if you look at the red plane, it's actually invariant on this axis, right? This axis is not in play for the red plane. Similarly, for the yellow plane here, this axis has no impact on the yellow plane. If you were to extend the yellow plane out till it hit the axis, it would hit, it would be, this edge is exactly parallel, right? But if you look at this purple or blue plane, you see that actually all three, x1, x2, and x3, are actually interacting with it. And if I was to take the intersection of three planes in 3D space, is it, what is the chances that I have these three planes, right? I have plane one, plane two. Okay. Can I have a volunteer? Can you help me? Plane one, plane two, and plane three, right? Three random planes. Are they going to pass through a line? It's pretty special when they do, right? Like this will be like this. They'll pass through a point when you take three planes in general. But what you get here is actually, thank you so much. What you get here is actually, they're all concurrent. They all happen to pass through this line. And what is this line? This line is the null space of uh, the matrix. So basically, if you multiply by anything on this line, you're going to stay on that line, and you're going to be, you're basically going to always get out, uh, sorry, you're not going to you're going to basically get out the zero vector, which means that, um, it's not, it's not going to be, a, it's not going to actually, any component in that direction is not going to affect your matrix vector transformation. Okay, I'm out of time, sorry. See you next class. Big hand for Pranav.